welcome to our event, Climate Justice and Feminism, One Struggle, One Fight. We have today three women here as key speaker with really different backgrounds and skills uh, who are today our guests. And I would like to welcome uh, Dorothy Nalubega from the P Green Party of Uganda. She is the head of the Women of the Green Party Uganda and she is also the coordinator of the Global Greens at the UN Climate Conference. And then from Washington, from the Heinrich Böll Foundation Washington, I welcome Liane uh, Schaletek. She is uh, heavily involved at the UN Climate Conference and an expert on climate funds. And she fights for the participation of women. And then from Berlin, <laughs> I'd like to welcome Lara Eckstein. She's a climate activist of Endegelände who fights for a feminist cli climate movement and she's pushing strong the topic of climate justice in Germany. Um, well, our first keynote will be from Uganda and Dorothy, I would like to give you the word. Thank you very much, Kathari, for inviting me here to speak to this. Well, good audience, I'm so happy to be here. I am Dorothy Nalvega, like she has said, I am from Ecological Green Party of Uganda. I am an environmentalist. I am also a women's rights um, activist. So this is really a good topic because it's interrelated climate justice and, 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 and feminism. Well, I would like to say that uh, the reason why we're having uh, this topic is because there is something that has been ignored Yes, we know very well that climate change impacts more on the poor, or I wouldn't say poor countries, but the uh, countries from the global south. But even though it impacts on them, there is a group that gets the heavier impact, and that is women. The women in the global south are affected more because there are caretakers, the women are expected to take care of their family, they are dependent on agriculture, they are dependent on natural resources, so with the, all the effects of uh, environment degradation, like um, long droughts, impact on them because they can't get food to feed their children, they can't get jobs to work since they are all um, mostly in agriculture sector. Also, as you are all aware, women constitute almost 70% of the world is poor. And you know very well that um, when the impacts of climate change hit, they hit the poor the hardest way. Because these are the people who live in ramshackled houses, the houses that will be washed away when we get uh, a flood, the houses that will be washed away when we get landslides. Recently in Uganda, uh, just three days after the IPCC report, we got landslides in eastern Uganda. All the houses were washed away. Uh, uh, hundreds of people were displaced. They had to, to leave this place. They don't have anywhere to stay. They don't have food. They don't have anything. And it was not only that, but they also lost lives. We lost about more than 41 people died in the landslides in Mududa, in eastern Uganda. But guess who were most affected? Normally when we have um, catastrophes like that, it is women and children who are most affected. That's why we think during the climate change discussions, women's voices should be heard. They should be involved because they are the caretakers and they make the right decisions. And normally, when we talk, us women, when we talk, I don't know about um, German, but in Uganda, when a woman talks, people will listen to her more and they will believe in them because they think we are, we are soft enough, so they will think we are telling the truth. But um, unfortunately, we are not involved in decision-making. 
that's why we are fighting for this gender uh, inclusion in decision making at uh, climate change conferences and discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Um, so first of all, uh, my name is Liana. I'm from Washington, from the Heinz Böll Foundation. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. I'm feeling uh, distinctively old in that crowd. I might be the oldest person in the room, um, but um, hopefully you forgive me for that. Um, with that comes um, some experience, I hope, if nothing else. Um, I've worked on issues related to gender, macroeconomics, and finance for more than 20 years. And so it, um, I came from actually a work on development finance and macroeconomic issues um, into the climate field and climate finance. And um, from a feminist perspective, I would say it's absolutely, absolutely necessary uh, that feminists engage in macroeconomic issues, um, trade, <coughs> finance, shift of financial flows. Um, very often we feel that you know women's groups um, um, getting like they hear about finance and ice class over. But unfortunately, uh, it's important to follow where the money goes, and not only where the money goes, but also influence where the money goes and make sure um, that current financial shifts um, or current financial flows are actually shifted away from fossil fuels or shifted into a different kind of investment understanding um, that we actually challenge, for example, what is happening um, on Wall Street and it's with that kind of understanding that I, over the uh, course of the last um, eight to ten years, have actually focused on a very narrow, in a way, but important subset of the climate negotiations, and that's um, largely climate finance. And um, if I could see a show of hand, what uh, do people know what climate finance is? Some people do, some people don't. Um, and actually, that confusion is not very surprising because there is not even a clear definition of what climate finance is. However, there is a clear definition of what it isn't. It's not aid. Um, but in the understanding of um, climate finance, it's actually the financial transfers, largely, that are uh, supposed to occur from developed countries to developing countries as an obligation under the UN Framework Convention on, on Climate Change. And so it's very important, again, that we are not confusing it with aid, something that is given out of the goodness of uh, developed countries' hearts, collective hearts, but it's actually an obligation and it's mandatory under the international climate regime. And so um, when I looked at why it was important to take gender considerations into account in, in, into climate finance a couple of years ago, um, it was actually trying to avoid mistakes that has, have been going on in development finance for years and years and years, you know, where you did lots of projects and at some point you thought, okay, maybe I should think about uh, bringing a gender perspective into that, but usually as something tacked on, not something that fundamentally shifted or fundamentally reconceptualized the way that you were approaching the investment. And so, um, you know, the work of the civil society groups with whom I'm engaging, including in some of the existing climate funds, is actually trying to make sure that you're not only treating a consideration of gender as something that is like a little sideshow, but that actually really fundamentally shifts the way you conceptualize and think about investment. And that's very hard. We've um, made some progress over the years, but we are by no means there. So why is it important? Um, Dorothy, very much from the experience in her countries and her communities, have, has shared why um, you know, there are actually very differentiated impact um, of climate change on men and women, but also um, why men and women, because of the situations they are, the approaches and experiences they have, um, they have different capabilities to actually address uh, climate change challenges. And I think it's very important that when we talk about women's role uh, or women's capability, that we are not talking about women as a, as a victim and the ones that are affected. And very often they are affected because they are marginalized, they are, you know, 
um, a disproportionate share of the poor, but not because they have inherently less capabilities to address um, challenges of climate change. But, you know, they might have to be given different tools, different opportunities, and different engagement forms. And that's actually what we are trying to look at in climate financing instruments. And so because, you know, climate change is not gender neutral, the impacts are there, differentiated impacts are there, the financing instruments that actually are supposed to provide the investment for climate actions need to also be uh, gender informed, gender aware. And I like to say that I would like to see 100% of all climate finance be gender responsive. And that does not necessarily mean that you are taking the whole bunch of money and putting it into women's project, but that for every investment you think about what is the needs or the different needs that when and women might have in a specific project. How do you ensure that I bring both men and women to the table to make decisions about a particular investment? Um, how does the investment that I do contribute to maybe a longer term call of uh, gender equality? How does it shift societal understanding? Those are all things that you would like to see incorporated in, in, uh, into climate financing instruments. Now, um, again, um, there is very limited amount of climate financing out there. There has been a commitment by developed countries that was already established in 2009 at the Copenhagen conference to mobilize jointly 100 billion per year by 2020. Um, this is seemingly a lot of money, but not if you look at the needs. The needs go into the trillions just for adaptation to deal with the most immediate impacts. You need hundreds of millions already. So because that money is very scarce in a way, and particularly public money that, that becomes available, you need to make sure that it's in invested in the best possible way. And my argument and the argument of many civil society actors that are looking for that kind of gender integration would be, it can be invested in a good way if it leaves 50% of the population um, out. If they don't partake in the benefits of the finance, they don't are part of the decision making about the finance. And what is the worst, the projects that are being financed are probably not sustainable, meaning they don't lead to uh, long-term shifts and transformations within the communities, within the countries where they occur. So this is one reason. And the other one is just because it's the right thing to do, right? I mean, it's not that climate finance happens in some little sideshow outside of international human rights obligations. All of the parties, meaning all of the countries that are engaging in the climate process, have also signed up in other human rights, in other UN contexts to a number of human rights conventions. For example, something called CEDO, which is the that's a mouthful. The Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. So this is a very important one, but then they are not thinking it together. You cannot separate the commitments that, as a, as a country that you do fight against the elimination of discrimination against women than from how you act in the climate process or in the international trade regime for that matter. So um, I think Katrin is looking at me oh, probably. Okay, okay. Um, if, if you guys have the patience, I will go into one or two more things and then, then we, can, um, we can move on. So there are a lot of um, international climate funds. Actually, about 10 years ago, they started to sprout up like mushrooms, right? The most important ones are the multilateral ones that are actually under the climate regime. Um, one of them is in the, the Green Climate Fund which is one in which I work together with a lot of civil society colleagues very actively and where I represent civil society perspective. And that fund was very exciting for us because it was a brand new fund. So our goal or our hope and expectation was that by creating an institution more or less from scratch, you could avoid some of the other mistakes and try to bring in a gender perspective from the very beginning. And that has worked to some extent, so we have some operational policies and some stipulations that say, for example, that the secretariat, meaning the, the technical operational staff, should be gender balanced, 
or that the board that makes decision should have a gender balance and I can tell you neither one is the case, you know, um, but at least there is the aspiration there, there is the mandate there, but it's also other things that they are saying, okay, if you want to partner with the fund, if you want to become an implementation partner, you have to have as an organization a gender <coughs> policy in, in the book. You have to have some expertise so that you not only get money for us, but you get money for us and can implement it in a way where a gender expert is looking at the project. So there are some advances that have been made on that. Um, uh, we are actually a lot further than we have been um, 10 years ago, but there is a, a lot, lot more to go, a lot, lot further to go. And the most important part is that we are not just talking about gender mainstreaming, again, bringing gender in by having a little bit, a little bit more women um, uh, participating, but we are actually talking about a very different set of investments or projects that you would like to see funded. And for example, that means that if you want to engage the private sector, you have to think about the fact uh, that women entrepreneurs um, are most, mostly found in the small and micro sector of, of uh, businesses. So when you hear about the small and medium sized enterprises, if you forget to talk about micro, small and medium sized enterprises, you actually leave a lot of the women entrepreneurs in countries out. They don't partake in the money. So um, pushing from micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises is already very important. Um, it's also very important um, to not just talk about renewable energy, but talk about renewable energy that addresses energy poverty. The fact that still in this world, in this day, um, close to one billion people have no access to electricity. And the ones, again, worst affected are the women, that need to provide um, services at home, cooking, cleaning, and so on and so forth. Um, cook stove is maybe a very, very simple um, example, but it's a very strong one. You know, the continued reliance of close to three billion people worldwide on um, basically cooking with biomass instead of clear, cleaner, or renewable energy solutions has a huge gender dimension. It also has a huge climate dimension because of so-called black carbon, which is you know a form of emissions that's actually working as an accelerant. So there are lots, there are lots of um, relationships. And again, if in your financing decisions you don't take that into account, you're using the scarce money that you have um, not in an effective way you are actually violating women's human rights and uh, again, you will not be able to do the transformational shift in the countries that receive that money. Again, receive the money not as aid, but something that they are due because they are getting an impact from basically an industrial, um, uh, historic industrialization that many, many countries have not profited from. Um, and then uh, we are wasting the money that we have. And that was a lot longer than two or three minutes. Thank you. Thank you for your input. <laughs>
economic interests are protected by nation states, so that in that sense, the conference, international conferences um, on climate change, the COPs, um, they will not really bring the solutions. Um, and the solutions have to come from the people, kind of. So what the, the, there was kind of a shift of the climate justice movement after the um, conference in 2009 that was already mentioned in Copenhagen. And uh, people said, okay, we no longer go to where we think the political power is and kind of address the politicians and ask them to please act in a different way. But we now go, go to the places where the actual destruction happens. And we protest there. So um, we, we are powerful ourselves because when we go with a lot of people and uh, we, for example, sit in front of the coal diggers, um, they can work no longer. So the, the power is within us if we organize and we are a lot of people. That's the idea behind it. Kind of. So um, End of the Land started in 2015 uh, with the first mass action of civil disobedience. And then kind of, because it went okay, it went well, we repeated it uh, every year. We, um, so we went to the open cast um, mines where lignite, brown coal, is extracted. Um, and there are three areas in Germany where this is mainly happening, in Rhineland and in Lausitz and close to Leipzig. And it really looks like you're on a moon or something. I don't know if you've been there or seen pictures. So we go there with a lot of people in an organized way and we kind of put our bodies on the line and we stop the destruction ourselves. That's the idea. <coughs> and uh, yeah, of course we will continue with actions like this. Um, uh, in the end of October, we went to the Rhineland with 6,500 people and we blocked the Hambachbahn, which is like a coal train. Uh, for more than 24 hours. Um, I think what's important, uh, what, what I, for me it's important to say that I really, really appreciate the work that Jan is doing and Dorothy is doing, of course. I, it's not like I see civil disobedience as the only way um, to stop climate change. Um, I rather think that there are many different forms of actions that we must take um, to stop climate change and save our planet. And, but I mean, um, for example, I thought of an example, if we look at how um, women in the UK uh, got to vote, got the right to vote, it was not because they, I mean, first they tried to like, talk to the men and present arguments and say, okay, like, let's talk and get an arrangement. But that's not how they got the right to vote. They got the right to vote because they were blowing up buildings. And I'm not saying we should make a small contest tomorrow, we should not. But but I think we need to keep in mind that those who are in power will never give up power voluntarily. Um, and we will always need a wide range of different forms of action to shift power structures. And actually a really good example of how that kind of worked, at least for now, is how we saved the Hamburg Forest. Um, it, it was people who lived there, it was a constant occupation um, in with a kind of militant appearance at least um, and um, and then it was actions of civil disobedience and then it was um, people like families uh, going on walks through the forest and demonstrations and really different from an action of actions and in the end we got the actually a, a, a court rule that said that the forest um, must not be um, destroyed for now so I think from this we can learn uh, and there are many other examples in this very course that we can learn if we want uh, immediate coal, ac coal exit fast um, and if we want climate justice, we have to continue to use different forms of action and uh, work together in solidarity. Um, but actually, like the question of the evening um, of the climate justice movement is uh, feminist. Um, I asked <laughs> that to myself. Um, uh, I mean, in, in some way, I think first of all, it's important to understand that um, people who are engaged in the um, climate justice struggle, I mean, we're all human beings, so we're not only climate activists, we have, some of us have, have a job or a university and we have relationships and so on. And uh, most of us, I think, at least from my experience, most of us are people who know that they're not like just two genders and know that this binary understanding of um, love and relationships um, actually not what most people feel like so it's um, yeah uh, contrary to people's needs 
So in that way, because we're not only climate activists, we're also queer people, we're also feminists, but we're also engaged in the climate uh, struggles. So in that way, you could say it's at least partly also a feminist movement. But also um, on the political level, um, I think that the struggles for climate justice are inherently feminist struggles. And we've heard from Uganda, and um, we've heard from Liana how women are affected differently. But also if we look here um, in the global north, for example, um, these open cast uh, mines, they also um, like pollute uh, kind of fine particles and people get sick from that. From that. And if we think about uh, children getting sick from these fine particles, who will take care for them? I mean, even in Germany, it's in families, it's mainly the responsibility of women to take care of children or of elderly people or of sick people. And also in our society, like who are the nurses, who is, who's working in kindergarten, etc. All this burden of extra care is taken mainly on women, not only in Uganda, also in Germany. Um, and another example would be um, if we, um, like going by car is a thing that just from statistics, men do it more often. It's more, mostly men that own cars and men take the car more often. So if we would now start to rebuild our cities and make more biking paths and make like sidewalks uh, easier to walk and we make free public transportation, that would be just in the way that women would benefit and elderly people would benefit and children would benefit, all those who don't have cars or can use the car. But it would also be good for the environment. So it would be a, so like a feminist thing to do and it would also be um, a, a climate thing to do. So th and there are many more examples where these, uh, you can see how things go together. Uh, so I would say all those who think they're feminists should also engage in the climate struggle in, in some way. But at the same time, when we strive for climate justice, we should also have this um, gender justice perspective. Kind of. um, but now, I think maybe you wonder, is it feminist to block a coal figure or something? Um, and I would say it depends on how you do it. I mean, it can also be feminist to bake a cake. It depends on how you do it. So <laughs> for me personally, I have to say it was something really, really empowering to see or to feel what I can do with my body. Um, like sitting on a coal track and just because I'm sitting here, the coal cannot go from the pit to the co uh, power plant. Because I'm sitting here and then thousands of other people are also sitting there. It was a really, for me, a really bodily experience. And I think if you're a person raised in a society that always tells you your body is not good enough or you should do that or you should buy that in order to like, have a good body or to be happy and be pretty, um, for me it was something really good to kind of feel how powerful my body is just as it is. Kind of. And I think this is something that everybody, like all people of all gender can experience in these um, actions of civil disobedience. Um, and also the climate justice movement, as I got to know it, is really special in the way that, first of all, there are a lot of really great and tough and intelligent female persons who just speak out and don't care about kind of gender expectations. They just do what they think is the right thing to do. But there are also a lot of really great guys who don't like give you a long talk of how feminist they are and how great they think feminist, feminism <laughs> is, but who they, they would just like maybe just shut up and just listen or just take a step back or just see, okay, there are dishes and they need to be done and then they would just do it without like making a scene about it. And this is like both of these things like, um, or these kind of people is something that I um, really like about the climate justice movement. But at the same time, to be honest, and um, I will maybe finish with this, when you do civil disobedience, it's uh, a kind of an extreme situation and you have a lot of adrenaline. And this is some situation where, in, for some people, like some people then really tend to play the, the tough guy. Um, in German, we say rummachen. And this is kind of a constant <laughs> challenge um, because our actions, they, are, they don't take part like separate from society. We're all um, coming from the society and it's a constant challenge um, in actions of civil disobedience to not fall back into these gender cliches, I think. Um, but we're trying. <laughs> Before we open the discussion, I have some
some quick questions um, to you. And so the first would be to Dorothy. Um, can you give us some, um, for, uh, for an example, some project you are involved in about um, yeah, some environmental project you are working in in Uganda? Um, being a green, first of all, um, and also being a, 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 a women's rights activist, I think uh, it is it was better for me to try and help the women first. So I thought uh, most of the women in Uganda use biomass. We use what we call charcoal and uh, wood for our cooking. Most of us, uh, at least 89% of us use that. And um, charcoal was becoming too expensive in my area. So I thought, what can I do? on the side of women and also for the environment. I thought uh, we have on, uh, alternatives for, for, for charcoal. We call them briquettes. Mm -hmm. These are things made from the west. So you don't have to spend much. You save on the money you used to buy charcoal. Uh, and, and at the same time, you're saving the environmental degradation. So uh, we, we got some people who know how to make these briquettes and we also got involved how, uh, ourselves. Because in Uganda, when you just stand there and say you do this and you're not involved, people will think you're just, you're just ordering them to do things that you also don't use yourself. So I had to learn first and then uh, invite some other people to help me and uh, also got involved. So. Um, we decide. Uh, we decided to uh, to gather the waste from our banana peels and also other waste to make uh, briquettes, which we use. Uh, the women use those briquettes to cook and also sell the extra. So I've been uh, going through that area to see whether the women are really using that, and I was so happy to see some of the small business owners using such briquettes that we made and also starting to gather the, the waste to do the briquettes. We also have uh, another thing which is called um, energy saving stoves. You see, we should start with these small things. Because for us in Uganda, we can't start talking of coal. We have to use what we have there. So we make uh, energy saving stops. We have uh, joint energy and environmental projects. We have trainers from there. They come to the villages and bring those energy saving stops to people. So instead of using three logs of firewood, you use one and it will take long to burn out. So that way you may think, it, how is that going to work? But if I save those two logs of firewood in my home three times a day, because we normally cook three times a day, a breakfast, lunch, and supper, uh, two logs for me, those are six logs a day, times ten homes, those are six ten logs. Imagine how many trees we will have saved. So these are the kinds of projects we are working on. Also, um, we have learned. Uh, we have learned to use um, modern irrigation uh, systems, whereby we use bottles. Like uh, uh, instead of throwing away the plastic bottles, we we put some hole in it and hang it on the plants, and they drip. We also use water harvesting. Like when it rains, you put some. You put some uh, some things outside and you get the water, you keep it for when the dry season comes. So those are some of the projects we've been working on. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. <laughs> I just have uh, one question more for you, because yeah. you're also involved in the UN Climate Conference and have uh, a lot of experience. And from your experience, do you have um, what, what key demands do you have to the interna international policy and also what 
demands do you have to Germany? Ah, uh, the demands I have to Germany, <laughs> actually, is uh, I want especially the feminist group in Germany to help the feminist group in Uganda to fight one um, the feminist group in Uganda don't know that they should also uh, fight for climate justice. They think they only fight gender-based violence, but it is related because some of the causes of gender-based violence are, I'll give you an example. In Uganda, us, the women, spend more time in the gardens than men. But imagine you spending uh, uh, much longer time on the farms, <laughs> and when the yields come, it is the man to decide how much to take to the market. Uh, he determines how much we should sell the, 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 the yields. And when the money comes, he decides on how to use it. Oh my God, this is so annoying. <laughs> how can I take that? So um, if you find someone like me, I won't allow you to do that. And what comes next? Of course, we are going to fight. And that is one of uh, the gender-based violences. So when this feminist group, uh, um, and when, w w w they demand for peace in homes, they demand for, but they don't look at the root causes. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, feminist groups in German should work hand in hand with the feminist groups in Uganda or in Kenya or in the <coughs> global south to teach them to evolve, like to think about climate change crisis and uh, climate justice. Oh, also, I would like to demand, it's not a demand, it's a request. <laughs> I would like to request that um, you, uh, German, German or people from the global north, facilitate the involvement of women at uh, climate change uh, conferences like COP, like COP, because uh, even after the the gender action plan in on COP twenty three, in which was in Bonn, still the governments have failed to put it in practice. Uh, we had a uh, we had a consultative meeting in Uganda, and they were uh, yes they tried to invite women just because it didn't cost anything. But women were so green about climate change. You talk of climate change mitigation, you talk of adaptation, you, call, you talk of resilience, and they don't know these things. And you ask, how many of you are going to COP24? And it's only men. Because the governments have not tried to uh, like send more, men, more women. So they, 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 they read it, they, but it just remained on paper. So I demand that um, German uh, tries to fix that somehow. <laughs> so also at COP, I request that um, uh, German or other countries present re-emphasize the gender action plan be put in practice, be implemented. <laughs> that it should not only remain on paper, but it should be implemented. The other request to German as an on international policy is that uh, I'm very much aware of the donations we get from German, but I demand that the government of German in its foreign policy um, puts uh, conditions on the grants they give us. Tell them Yes, Uganda government, I'm giving you this, maybe for, for mobility, like to ease mobility, but you should first prove to me that what you're going to do is uh, gender sensitive. Mm -hmm. That there is, because uh, there are some tools like gender budgeting, some organizations have tried to, to, to teach, like government officials, but they don't even mind about it. So I demand that you put conditions on the, on the governments and tell them you look, you should do this. And also this will also try uh, to see 
that it is like a monitoring tool also. You know Uganda is a, sin, a signatory to some of the commitments, international commitments on human rights like the Convention on uh, Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, the CEDAW, but <laughs> it's just on paper. It's not implemented. We still see a lot of inequalities and you have, you've already seen how um, gender equality and climate change uh, uh, interrelated. So um, it should be like a tool to monitor whether these uh, 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 commitments are really uh, implemented in order for us to realize climate, um, uh, climate change um, adaptation. So I think that would be my demands. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, Liane, um, because you are also involved in the UN Climate Conference, um, can you give us some more examples? How can we ensure that women can participate equally in the decision-making process? And also, which tools are really useful um, for pushing gender-sensitive budgets? Okay, um, has a couple of layers. Um, so, within the climate negotiations, I mean, uh, the one point that that um, Dorothy mentioned um, uh, is is very pertinent, and that's just increasing in the country delegations that you have. Uh, the participation of women, uh, and not just for the participation of women's sake, um, but uh, just because having more women in, in the room, and um, again, it would be important that those women then as experts are involved in all the strands of negotiation, so not just talking about adaptation or capacity building, but also talking about mitigation, technology, and finance, because it shapes um, the discourses, it changes the discourses, and that's exactly what we need. We need to get away from the business as usual approaches and discussions, but actually widen with the diversity of perspective the approaches that we are thinking about. So I think um, the participation, again, is, is, a, is, a, is a crucial part of it, but I think it's also important to increase um, and understanding the gender awareness and the gender expertise of the men negotiators as well. So I don't want to want to leave it at just bringing more women into it, because I think it's also important that you raise um, the awareness that gender has something to do with climate change, that gender has something to do with the technology approaches that you take, that gender has something to do with the way you provide uh, transparency of, of whether you fulfill your commitments. So right now, um, when you look at the, the COP24, meaning the, the um, climate conference that next week is starting in Katowice in Poland, um, there the idea is to actually decide on, quote unquote, the rule book, which is basically the operational guidelines for implementing the Paris Agreement. Uh, and it's very, very important that into those rule books, some of the gender and human rights dimensions are integrated. So that if, for example, you report about, as a country, how well you are fulfilling your commitment under the Paris Agreement, you provide gender disaggregated data. You um, have a section <coughs> where you report on whether men and women uh, benefit from, from the actions that you are doing. Um, for climate finance, for example, it's very important that you talk about um, uh, what kind of money uh, you are going to be putting forward as a developed country? Will you put that money forward as a loan? Will you put the money forward as a grant? Um, just the quantity of money is, 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 is not enough. We have to talk about the quality of the finance that is provided. And if you think that has nothing to do with gender, um, then, then I can give you an example that it very well has. If you provide a loan to a developing country for climate action, that loan has to be repaid. So if you then have the country receiving a lot of loans for climate activities, that might mean um, that they are shortchanging their investment in providing health services, providing education services, and so on and so forth. Which is why a call under climate justice 
that public financing, for example, for adaptation should be provided all in France is inherently also a gender just um, uh, call. So I think issues like that are, are very important. And then um, uh, talking about the obligation of developed countries to provide finance and increasing the finance, and again, increasing public finance is crucially important because a lot of the investments that we need to do, the actions that we need to take, are not necessarily um, are, are providing a lot of return on investment, are something where the private sector is going to be jumping in. And particularly not in cases where some of your priorities are actually supporting uh, the social network, the livelihoods um, of people, and some, some of the um, you know, providing a multitude of benefits, environmental benefits, social benefits, gender equality benefits. And those are not all maximum profit raising. So you need to make sure that a lot of public finance is available and a lot of public finance is available in the form of grants and not loans. And so again, striving for that as part of the climate process is an inherently feminist um, struggle. Um, and then obviously you're trying to redirect again uh, what kind of investments uh, you make. That also means, for example, pushing against um, bad technologies. Uh, so the idea that you can basically fix the climate through technology fixes, carbon capture and storage, geoengineering, engagement against those kind of forms is a feminist engagement. So I want to just point out that we have to get away from a very narrow understanding of how you engage in the climate process or how you increase the participations. What are some really useful tools? Um, 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 again, I think some of the useful tools are definitely gender analysis. Um, the fact that you um, provide more data, gender differentiated data is very important. Um, that you also have, I think for me, one of the most effective tools is actually that interplay that um, Laura, Lara, sorry, was talking about, meaning that you actually have women activists and feminist activists um, that are engaging in multiple forms. Again, I think that it might just be because I'm a, I'm a geek, that it's a very feminist engagement to try to understand um, you know, the intricacies of financing approaches and then to try to undermine basically how financing is provided or find new forms to make, uh, make sure that women and men and everybody in between can benefit from it, right? Or to fight, for example, in a, in a, in a, in a public fund uh, for a gender um, policy that goes beyond the binary approach, uh, even if that incurs a lot of backlash. Um, it is feminist, you know, to, to do the engagement uh, uh, um, the, of civil disobedience and mass organizations. And we have many, many strong feminist leaders that are also grassroots movement organizers. And for the work, for example, in the process, it's important to have those voices and aggregate up those voices from the grassroots. <coughs> um, mass demonstrations are, are a very, very powerful tool, often more important than a technical intervention can be. But you need those very speci specified technical interventions as well to change something within the processes. So I think it's that interplay um, that is really important, and that means um, the engagement of, uh, of feminists on all levels of, of climate process, inside, outside, you know, forms of outreach and education, how you change your own life, um, and then also how you engage in political processes. And that means also who or what you vote for, very basically. You know, we all have the right to vote. We heard about it, how difficult it has been for women um, to get the vote. So, I mean, this is probably less a, an issue here in, the, uh, in, in, in Germany as it is in the United States. But it's actually, you know, it's actually a, a crime against feminism if you're not taking your right or your obligation to vote seriously and, and then try to influence through your vote um, the kind of decision makers that you get into power. Yes. Uh, before I open the discussion, I have one last question to Lara. And, uh, well, we can vote in Germany, but still, 
man decides in Germany the climate policy because they are sitting in the government places, they are in um, the decision making structures inside the energy and car companies, so they have the power right now about the climate policy in Germany. So is it enough to just, um, well, to push uh, an equal participation inside the system or do we need to change something more? Well, I mean, our chancellor is a woman in Germany and so we don't have climate justice yet established. So um, um, I think what's important is about decisions that we involve those people who are really affected by the decisions. And this is not the case in decisions on climate change. They're taking place at the International Conference and also in the coal commission that we have here in Germany. I mean, women in Uganda are affected by the fact that Germany is emitting so much greenhouse gas, but they are not sitting in the coal commission. They, they don't have a say. They, they're, they're, their voices are not heard. So, I mean, on the... I think it's really important that on short term we um, really um, get some money and good adaptation technology, etc. Um, right now, but on the long term we need to um, develop a different way of taking decisions so that those people who are affected are involved in the decision making. Um, and this is something we have to kind of build up from bottom up. And also we need a different economic system, one that is not based on exploitation and so that we are not centered around GDP, that we don't have to have economic growth all the time, because like, there's no way to have growth all the time on a limited planet, and there, like, there are always more greenhouse gases emitted if we have more economic growth. So on the long term, we need a different political and a different economic system, and this will not come from those who have created the problem, but it has to come from kind of us, and it has to be built from bottom up, and um, I don't have a master plan on how this is going to be. I think it's just important that we all try to do our bits and pieces all, all around the world. Okay. Uh, from your really different perspective, what are your hopes and goals for the future? What should happen? And why is it important to get involved? <laughs> oh, now she's filming again, so this is on tape again, so this is hard. <laughs> no, no, I don't use that. <laughs> um, with what, what is happening, or like what the climate justice grassroots movement will do in the future? Um, I don't really know. Like, um, like I said, Andy Glenda did the mass action at the end of October, and um, it's only like Andy Glenda is only one tiny part of this big um, movement. So there are different, a lot of different other groups. Um, like this year, we also had a mass action of civil disobedience in the Czech Republic and one in the Netherlands. Um, and what's I didn't say that yet, but it's kind of the nucleus, like the most important um, meeting point of the climate justice movement are the climate camps, and they are kind of also popping up um, in different countries um, around Europe. And I'm like, I don't know yet what will happen next year, and but there will be a lot of different climate camps in Germany and in different other regions, um, and like the. the struggle for coal exit will continue. It's not only brown coal, it's also um, hard coal, black coal um, that we need to fight against. And it's not only the energy sector, like it's um, when we look at um, transportation, when we look at agriculture. So actually it will start in January or February that groups will meet and get together. And it's mostly it's like open meetings on weekend and everybody can come and bring ideas and then we create kind of working groups and get together and um, I don't know what Endergland will do next year. It also depends on what the German government will say about coal exit, etc. Um, the only thing I can say for sure is that there will be climate camps and uh, you're very invited to come. It's a great place to also kind of to try to live this alternative that we're always talking about. Like we try to live together in, in a like in solidarity and in a sustainable way and uh, share the care work in a fair way. Um, and the only action that um, I know of so, so far is an uh, action against um, chemical fertilizers. Um, it's 
like the movement is called Free the Soil. They will have a meeting, a plenary meeting in January in Berlin. Um, so, and they're also always looking for people to join. So Free the Soil, they have a website. So look that up. And yeah, and the Gelände also has websites and local groups, not only in Berlin, but in different other cities. It's also um, on the Endegland website. You can look for the local groups um, and yeah, come along and see it. Like I said, it's important that you find people that you would like to work with and then you can see um, and decide together with the others what will happen next year. I don't know. Yeah, what are your goals? Okay, so <laughs> my personal goal um, and, and that's probably what I'm, what I'm trying to stay engaged in is actually really getting um, uh, to a place, well, it's, it's several goals. One is I would really like to see a lot more groups, uh, feminist groups particularly, um, not shy away from macroeconomics and financial um, topics. Um, do some of the front work of that engagement because I think it's, it's, in, it's important because sometimes in order to understand what you don't want, you need to understand how certain things function. Um, and also um, to the extent that not everybody wants to do that, but to the extent that some of us have to engage in the structures, with the structures, with the politicians, it's very important to find access points or ways of undermining business as usual approaches. So I think for that, that kind of technical understanding, and again, not everybody can do it, um, but I would like to have a lot more feminists engaging in those discourses or not shying away from, from macroeconomics and finance discussions. On a personal level, I would like to um, if I'm still doing that in 10 years, um, not, not see any blank stairs anymore when I say, you know, I want 100% of um, climate finance to be gender responsive, human rights centered and based and, and contributing, you know, to um, community owned, community participated um, approaches in, in recipient countries. That would be my goal. And also making sure that those um, climate instruments that you have, like climate funds, are actually um, making it their priority to give money, not just to governments, but a lot of the communities and the groups, including women groups directly, and create avenues to make that possible. And if we achieve that, or even move um, a, a further bunch of steps or a long way towards that, I would be extremely happy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, um, like I said, I'm from the green part of Uganda, and my goal would be actually for us to take power. How shall we make like policies? We are not allowed. We'll have our ideas go and sleep with them, make noise on Facebook and everywhere. But it won't be uh, like uh, it won't be like a policy. It won't be like a law. But if we take power in 2021, where we have the next elections, we shall have the power to make policies and implement them. That's my <laughs> thinking as a Green Party member. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all for being here.